Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I have here Mr. D. Neil Elliott. He's author of A Higher Road, and we're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about uh, meditation, because that's something I'm very interested in. I, I'm, I'm working on it. I've come a long way, but I'm still working on it. But before we do anything else, tell us a little bit about you. Well, hi, Kyle, and thank you so much for uh, uh, enabling me to be on the show with you today. Oh, yeah, I look forward to this conversation. Uh, you know, let uh, I'll do a quick little snapshot of my background so everybody knows kind of who I am or, or gives you context anyway. So born in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and I've lived across Canada. Um, and I've traveled around the world, uh, currently 61 years old. So I was born in 1960, uh, married, uh, second marriage, uh, have three kids between us and uh, five grandchildren. And all my grandchildren are uh, live in Texas. Uh, professional engineer with an MBA. Yeah, exactly. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Texas, for, Texas forever <laughs> is, the, uh, is the phrase, right? <laughs> Um, and, uh, work in, and I've worked in the hydroelectric industry for over 30 years, uh, as a project manager, manage, uh, small projects, a few hundred thousand to a hundred million dollars. So that's kind of gives context for, for, uh, who I am and, uh, you know, kind of gives a, a grounding in that obviously I'm science-based, you know, I'm, uh, I like to see it i like to measure observe measure calculate you know those kinds of things and those are the things that i used to say i believe <laughs> and i said there's still truth in those things i'm not saying any different but <laughs> but i've gone beyond that now well i think i think that uh spirituality and and science can coexist um you know I mean, there might be a few things some people say contradict, but I, I don't think so. I, I think God gave us the brains to figure this stuff out. I mean, it's, um, it's and, perfection. <laughs> yeah, well, and I would agree with that. Uh, you know, they coexist and uh, they can complement each other. Uh, materialistic science only goes so far. Um, and uh, quantum physics is, you know, kind of trying to make that other leap. Uh, but uh, you know, the process that I ended up following bridged this gap between spirituality and science. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, what got you on that path? Well, uh, so let's talk a little bit about, or, you know, I'll give it, I'll give short strokes on this. So bottom line is that, you know, I grew up, I became an engineer, a professional engineer, and I went into the, into business. And in the 90s, so I'd be in my 30s, I thought, oh, I'd like to kind of, you know, see if I could be more inclusive with uh, other people's, um, you know, perspectives of life. So I picked up spiritual books, you know, Dr. Wayne Dyer, Carolyn Mice, those kinds of things, Napoleon Hill, Tony Robbins, and was reading that. And that's also when um, uh, positive thinking came out. So I took up some positive thinking courses in that. And they all great authors and they all shared good stuff. And, um, but I couldn't really ever make anything work to fundamentally shift how I thought, you know, this is right. This is wrong. This is good. This is bad. This is true. This is false. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it came out outside of those parameters, then, you know, it's kind of like, eh, you know, uh, maybe discount those opinions. And, um, then uh, in 2002, I went into consulting and life became about work, pleasing clients. You don't want to please clients, you don't get work. So, you know, you work, 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 work. You don't get paid when you don't work, so you work. <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, so uh, what happened, though, from 2002 to 2015, I slowly drove myself into this really deep and despondent depression. And, uh, in 2015, I recognized I was there and I thought, you know, like I am just, life was miserable. I just, I just wanted to be done with it. 
I, there was no real purpose. Uh, I couldn't see a purpose. I worked hard. I made a lot of money. I spent a lot of money, couldn't get ahead. Um, you know, just not happy with life at all. Now we're all great actors in our environment. We can put out whatever we want to family, friends, clients. So no one knew what I was like inside. They all thought I was, you know, kind and affable and, you know, all the good things, but inside I was like, I just wanted to be done with it. So, um, I picked up some newly issued spiritual books and, and I went through the same process and, as I did in the nineties, trying to change how I thought, but stuff that we program in our subconscious mind, you can't will that change in those thoughts. So you, you program these things in your subconscious mind, uh, they become synaptic responses, uh, and, uh, you need a process to actually, they're like concrete. You need a process to break them up and dissolve them. And, uh, so these things, all the books I picked up, they were great and they offered good stuff, but again, I couldn't change it. So I sat down, you know, in 2017, uh, November 9th, 2017, I sat down on a kitchen table, our house that had been on the market for, you know, seven years finally sold. And, um, so I was, I crafted my suicide note. My wife had gone to visit friends or family in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I sat down and crafted my suicide note, planning it out. And um, I wanted to make sure my wife was going to be financially okay, say goodbye to family, friends, you know, my kids, uh, but not let them know what I was going to do, of course, and then just pull the trigger. So about three months out. And uh, about a week prior to that, some information came to me that um, promised to liberate me from my thinking. And uh, being an engineer, I was like, okay, well, fine, I'll, I'll push the three month date out and I'll try this. If it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, then uh, I can always, you know, commit suicide. And uh, <clears throat> a year later, I was just, I, you know, kind of my depression was totally gone. I was full of this inner peace and joy and full of love. And I felt totally prosperous and, and, and abundant. And, um, I just, I wanted to share it with everybody, but I had, I thought, well, you know, if I get on the roof, I want to get on the rooftops and shout it to everybody and I'm going to be looked at like an idiot. So I won't do that. So it took me a couple of years, you know, as I carried on with this process, it took me a couple of years to figure out the best way to do that is to share my story in a book. And so, um, I wrote my book, uh, a higher road, cleanse your consciousness to transcend the ego and, as and ascend spiritually. And I offer the seven step process that I went through that changed, that fundamentally changed how I thought. And my hope of course, is that people will read this book and then make a decision for themselves if it makes sense for them. And if it does go back and start with step one or some of the science material. But my goal is to actually help change the consciousness of the world. Uh, and bring us into a new era of love and peace. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but it takes every individual needs to do this for themselves. You can't, you know, hire it out. You can't hire somebody to do this work for you. You know, life is an inward journey and you got to do it yourself. And um, when you're ready, you'll know, but you actually need a process to do this. And, um, and I happened to, uh, I was fortunate enough to come along with, uh, or, or to, what was given to me was this process to make this happen. I can now look back and say that this was all, you know, kind of uh, divinely ordained, if you will, for this to happen to me to share this story. And, uh, and yeah, my goal is to help people. You know, it's, it's funny that it's easier to hate than it is to love. So to strive for peace, it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of effort, but I don't, I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's maybe uh, not not going to happen. I hope it does. <laughs> and that's all I can do is hope, <laughs> have faith that it does. But you know, you 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 talked about wanting to end your life, and which is something that I've suffered from since an early age, uh, several attempts, and was fortunate that someone found me at the last minute, but they found me, and. Uh, you know, I'd got to where, you know, at first it was, I wanted the attention. So I would write out a note and it was like, okay, if I don't write out a note or 
you know, be around anybody and just go off on my own, you know, I'll be done with it. Something always happened to intervene. And as much abuse as that I've done to myself through the years, through drug and alcohol and, you know, running around doing a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing. For some reason, God kept me around. I felt like he had a purpose for me. So I'm here for a reason. Otherwise I shouldn't be here. So uh, I, I know where you're, where you're coming from. I was, uh, and I had everything to live for as far as like children and family and all that, but I just, I wasn't happy either. So I, I wanted to know more about how you got out of that. Yeah. So, um, and I'm, and I'm glad you're here. So Thank we can have this conversation, but yeah, you do have a purpose <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about that because what we really need to do is talk about the purpose of the soul as well. So, uh, so we can talk a little bit about that, but how'd I get out of it? So, um, I'll say this in retrospect, but I'll tell you kind of how it worked for me is, um, I had picked up some books in 2015 that I was reading that what it was doing is it was preparing me to receive this other information I received. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, all of this is laid out in a higher road, by the way. So, uh, and just briefly on that. So what I ask everybody to do, my recommended way to read a higher road is read it cover to cover, uh, understand the process in its entirety, make a decision for yourself, whether this resonates with you or not. If it does go back and start with some of the science stuff or, um, uh, or, start directly with step one. A uh, second part of my book. So first parts, there's five parts. First part is kind of what you're going to learn. Second part, I did a really candid uh, memoir and I'm a very private person, but I made it very candid because I want everybody to understand as an example, I use my life to share with everybody the kinds of behaviors or kinds of thinking and feeling that I adopted at a very young age that I reinforced over a lifetime that created every experience and every event that came into my life. And, and those things all happen for a reason to teach us lessons, teach your soul lessons. But, um, uh, I, I do that in, in this uh, memoir. And then, uh, part three of the book is really around consciousness and science, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about in a moment here, which kind of opened me up to receive this other information. Part four, I share this new information or some of it anyway. And part five is my experience, my personal experience of, as I went through the seven steps. So how did it happen? Well, uh, some of the books I picked up um, helped me with this process of preparing me to receive this other information. And the first thing I had to learn was what really is consciousness. And I used to think consciousness was in my brain, what I had, what I thought about uh, was something that I, I was either exposed to, learned, or, um, you know, kind of experienced. And so every thought I thought was in my brain. And um, what I learned was that what I believe to be right or wrong, true or false, good or bad, is really fundamentally just a belief. And so the first thing you, you and I share all these books with people and, and recommend they read them if... Um, if they're not, uh, you know, kind of familiar with this material or if they need this to kind of prepare themselves. And uh, so if you can understand that everything that you believe is just a belief, you now have a bit of a crack, a little opening that can get you to a point when you understand a process to actually break up and dissolve these uh, fundamental beliefs and uh, processes that you have in your subconscious mind to help you actually shift how you think. Everything that we see in our world is a reflection of your beliefs. And when you can change your beliefs, even though nothing changes in your environment, you see the world differently. And when you see the world differently, you behave and you act differently. And you think differently. You'll think differently. And um, so what I learned by some of these science books that I read, that's all founded in science, is that first off is everything we believe, everything that we think is really just a belief. And that what we think about 
um, affects the expression of a cell. And by expression of a cell, I mean the work it does. So you can either promote the health of your cell through your thoughts, or you can be detrimental to it. And that's a book I share on epigenetics, all based in science that'll take you through this process of understanding this. So they know in science today, what you think will affect your health. And um, so knowing it's good and understanding it's in science is good because that can give some people some a foundation to kind of believe. So for me, being a, you know, more of a, on the scientific bent of things, I like things that I can observe, measure and, <laughs> and calculate. And so something in science helped me with that. Um, the next thing I read was a book on neuroplasticity, which was really, you know, a book around how the plasticity of the brain. So how you think goes through certain pathways in the brain, neural pathway. And you can, through a process, change how those pathways are developed in the brain. So when you think a certain way for a very long time, you reinforce this neural pathway. So it happens very quickly. You go from whatever you're experiencing to whatever thought you're going to have, be it a, a happy, joyous thought or an angry, uh, you know, kind of negative thought. And you can change those uh, neural pathways. You can also grow new brain cells. That, in, that they discovered in the 1960s. And the books I read, uh, I offer one for people to, to read, which is very easy to read, and some great examples of real life things uh, that happened to people to change how they thought. So someone with a brain injury that had you know, negative effects from that, how they changed their thinking to mitigate those um, negative effects from the brain injury. Then I read a book <clears throat> um, about it from another author, and it was her experience, uh, near-death experience. So um, this woman, she was, you know, uh, over a four-year period from about the age of 42 to 46, she suffered from this aggressive form of cancer that left her at the age of 46 with tumors in her body from her waist to her head. And, um, <clears throat> she fell into a coma. She, her body weight dropped from a normal body weight to, I don't know, 75 to 90 pounds, something in that range. She couldn't lift her head by herself. Uh, she was on oxygen 24 hours a day and needed 24 by seven care. She fell into a coma. <clears throat> they rushed her to the hospital and the attending physicians told her that her, her family and her husband, that she wouldn't make it through the night. <clears throat> excuse me. And she, um, she woke up 24 hours later and she declared she was going to be okay. And within two weeks, they couldn't find a trace of cancer in her body. So all of this is documented in hospital records. Now they don't know why they call it a spontaneous remission, but th the thing that's important with her book is that she describes exactly what she experienced when she was in this uh, 24 hour coma. And, uh, it's a fascinating read. Uh, and she um, brought back certain messages with her. And, and some of those messages are, were things like, we come from love, we return to love, we are unified after we die. Um, and she felt like she was expanding to become part of everything in the universe. So she describes that as um, everything in the universe has consciousness within it. And she felt like she was becoming part of that consciousness and all of these things that she was around her. The important thing for me at the time when I read that book is she brought back a particular message, which, um, which helped me. Uh, and that was, we're not judged after death. And so I could understand her book and I, I could believe her book, but I couldn't really understand, you know, uh, fundamentally understand all these things she was talking about, but I could believe it because, you know, she experienced it and I wanted to believe it, of course. So that gave me the permission to sit down and craft that suicide note because I had this little nagging Christian doubt that if I committed suicide, I wouldn't be going to a good place. And, um, <clears throat> but this other information had showed up for me that did this final bridge between spirituality and science. And so these books I read ahead of time in the near-death experience, what it really did was it opened me up opened up my consciousness to understand a new concept of consciousness and prepare me for this information that, uh, that I was about to receive. And then, uh, and then I embarked on this journey 
um, from that point. Now, um, I'll have to say, like someone like me, my beliefs are everything. Uh, they have definitely changed through the years. I mean, I, that was a party animal hellion, you know, when I was younger, and that slowly changed through the years. I mean, I, I had to go through a lot to change my beliefs, but once I kind of got grounded, my beliefs um, were re. I don't know. How I don't want to say this. Uh, my belief in the Bible was more prevalent, I guess you'd say. Um, the, 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 the notion that the majority of what people think is what's to differentiate differentiates between good and bad and that kind of thing, which is something that I don't believe. Um, so it's going to, it's going to be hard to, <laughs> to convince me, I guess. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about what we know in science, and then we'll kind of go down this other little path here. So, you know, what do we know today in science that we didn't know 100 years ago, 150 years ago? And, and the question is going to be, when did consciousness first creep into living matter? So what do we know in science today? What we know in science today is that at a subatomic level, everything is just energy. And um, so what that means is that things that you observe that you think are solid or your hand or your arm that we think are solid or, you know, full of fluids and stuff like that um, is there's really more space in there than there is anything solid. And so science believes that there was a big bang uh, out of that big bang came what we see as the material universe came uh, electromagnetism and all of the solid matter and things like that, um, that we see today. And um, they believe that these, uh, you know, kind of uh, electrical particles somehow got together, they fused and they formed elements. And then these elements um, kind of randomly got together in the correct combination to form a living molecule and the living molecule is the first self-replicating um, thing in the universe uh, that science believes is self-replicating. And then these uh, self-replicating living molecules randomly got together to form a first living cell. And then over billions of years, we have what we have today. Um, and we know this in science. And um, so let's look at cells for a moment. We'll, you know, so the sperm fertilizes the ovum. And uh, over, you know, one cell divides into two, divides into four, et cetera. And over a nine month period, we build this intricate body. The other thing that we know in science today is that every cell in the body has the library of information for the entire body. The only difference between a liver cell and a skin cell is the work that it does. So these cells get together. Um, they, you know, will build a liver. They'll maintain that liver over a lifetime. They never intrude on anybody else's work. They don't suddenly spring into making an ear when they're making a liver and they maintain that there's more harmony in our cells, in our body than the, than we display as humans when we're building a project. And so <clears throat> you look at one cell. So one cell has this permeable membrane around it. It gives it individuality. And that permeable membrane um, will, let, will uh, the cell can discern what is the right nutrition for it that's going to promote its health. It accepts it in through the membrane. It discerns when toxic waste is built up and that it needs to eject it out of that membrane in order to maintain its health. So it does that. That's the first act of consciousness. And <clears throat> so cells have consciousness in it. I think science could actually make that leap and say yes. So then the question is, well, if cells have consciousness in it, why wouldn't the living molecules that got together have consciousness in it? And if those living molecules have consciousness in it, why wouldn't the elements that form together randomly, as science says, have consciousness in them to form this um, living molecule? And if these living and if these elements have consciousness in it, why wouldn't the electrical particles, particles have consciousness in it? 
there is a life force that flows throughout the universe that um, is driven by electro electromagnetism that flows into all of elements and all of creation. And that life force is driven by what we may call God or the creator or Allah or Yahweh or the Tao, whatever you want to call it. And that life force is consciousness. We are not matter imbued with consciousness. Everything that you see is consciousness made visible. And it's made visible through, through the good services of electromagnetism, through the descent and vibrational frequency. And so <clears throat> if you can understand this, the, the information that I share with people that, that transformed how I thought and understood how the universe works and how creation works and how we utilize the services of electromagnetism moment by moment in our day to create every event and every experience that comes into our life. When you understand these processes in its entirety, you can make a choice of consciously changing your life. And I can tell you that I, you know, as soon as I knew these processes, then I knew why I was depressed. I knew how come I was depressed and I knew why I was depressed and I knew how to change it. Cause it, you go through a process of, of, uh, of understanding what you're doing to yourself that you're creating moment by moment by your thinking and your feeling. So when you come in as a little baby, your soul is infused in that process of conception and your soul is perfect. Your soul is a fragment of divine consciousness. So I'll call it, I'll call it divine consciousness in this conversation. So your soul is a fragment of divine consciousness. It is unconditional love. It is perfect. And when you first come in, you know, like if a baby's been born into an environment of means where it's fed and looked after and clothed, um, you know, it's this little embodiment of joy. And until age five, when you dis your brain is developed enough where you start to make your own decisions around things, um, all you really are is this little sponge that's picking up everything in its environment. You know, all your feelings are your parents and your family and your siblings and their thinking and those kinds of things. So you're being molded and shaped at age five, you start to make your own decisions. You're still being influenced by everybody that you're around and your experiences. And as we grow from babyhood to adulthood, we think we're becoming versed in the ways of the world. But what we're really doing is we're shutting ourselves from off from the light. We're binding down our soul with the mechanisms of the ego. The ego is also created at the time of conception. And the ego can only um, do things for you through these two mechanisms of bonding or rejection. It bonds with everything it likes. You know, I like that food. I like that car. I like that house. I like that person. It rejects everything it doesn't like. I don't like that person. I don't want to go to that event. I don't want to live in that neighborhood. And so these are the only mechanisms that the ego has. And the ego has control of your life and it binds down your soul and shuts it off from its connection with its source of being until your soul finally wakes up to understand what it's doing to itself. And then it begins this process to shed all of these uh, ego mechanisms and thinking that enables it to connect back with the divine. So your soul comes through in many lifetimes. It comes through you know, in varying genders, in varying places of origin, in varying colors of skin and races and religions and education and sometimes wealthy, sometimes poor. All of these things are designed for your soul to learn the lessons it needs to learn through an evolutionary process. And that evolutionary process, when your soul finally, you know, learns these lessons and, and understands, it'll come into some lifetimes where it works to transcend the ego. And when you can fully transcend the ego, your soul steps into the light and it does not have to be reincarnated again. And that's when your real life begins. And <clears throat> so when I went through this process that is, you know, kind of based in science and then does this gap to help you understand what was before the big bang, what was the impetus for the Big Bang? What happened at the time of the Big Bang and what happened after the Big Bang? And then how we use these tools of electromagnetism 
with our thinking and our feeling to create all these experiences in our life for our soul to learn these lessons. When you learn this and you learn the meditative process that you need to follow to do this. So, you know, my book, the <clears throat> first, I'm going to stretch your consciousness. Step two is unveiling these truths. Step three is a reflection for you personally. You write yourself a letter about how you really feel about life. Would you rather be done with it or are you happy with it? And then you're going to go through a process to cleanse your consciousness. There's some very specific things that you need to cleanse. And then you're going to rebuild your consciousness to be in alignment with uh, the source of your being, the attributes of unconditional love, and there's some other things. And then you're going to learn this daily meditation that you need to do. And then you're going to do a rinse and repeat. And you're going to go back and you're going to continue this cleansing process and rebuilding process and, and uh, following this meditative practice. And a year after, 13 months after I began this process, I went into two meditations that were two days apart. So it was in late December 2018. And <clears throat> I went into this meditation and um, I was just, I was enveloped, like in bathed in unconditional love, an unconditional love that you know I can't even describe. We don't have the language to describe it. I didn't care what happened to my body. I didn't care what ailments it had. I didn't care what anybody had done to me in the past. I didn't care about anything. I just wanted to stay in that state forever. And that is the state that I think is just a little glimpse of what you're going to feel when you pass from this lifetime and back to be unified with, with the divine. And, um, and so this process I've now been doing since uh say late november of 2017 mm -hmm. so it's just into my four years now and i can tell you it just gets better and better and better and when i see someone now what i see them i see anybody now i see what i see is i see their soul and their soul is equal to my soul and it is beautiful and it is pristine and it is unconditional love and anything that they're doing is just the mechanisms of the ego trying to create these events and experiences in their life for their soul to learn the lessons it needs to learn. I no longer judge anybody. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, agree with some things that people are doing, but that's a judgment for myself that I won't do that. I don't judge anybody else. And now it doesn't mean we should let murders run around and kill everybody. But we don't need to judge them. We, what we really need to do is understand that their soul is perfect. Their soul is unconditional love. And it's really just their ego that is creating these situations for them that's trying to teach them the lessons that they need to learn. And when you understand this process and you go through this process and you make this connection with back with the divine, um, it, is, it is altogether beautiful. It is just, it is amazing. And, it, and for me... I can only talk about me. It took me seven months. So I go through this meditative process at the seven month mark. I felt this little tingling at the top of my head. It was about the size of the dime. I didn't know what it was, uh, but I just kept going through the process and I just kept growing bigger and bigger. Today, you could put a bowl over my head that goes down to the bottom of my ears and that opening is my entire head. And <clears throat> the, um, our creator is you know, radiates to all of us, all of creation, unconditional love, unstintingly. But it is so spiritually refined, such a high frequency of vibration that it cannot make itself known to us until we begin this process to cleanse our consciousness and reach back through, through this meditative process to connect back with the divine. And when you do that, it steps in to help you with this process of cleansing and rebuilding. And then you'll feel this spiritual inflow of energy into your head. And then it'll move into your body. It'll move down one up, so down one side, up the other. And it'll be, then, you know, you'll, right now what happens to me is it, it either comes into my head or comes into my heart. And it, it will fill me from, you know, my solar plexus to my head. It is just, it is the most beautiful. And when, when this stuff happens to you, you will know that what you know now is true. And you will never look back. And it's just this amazing, wonderful process that I, 
I personally just want to share it with everybody because, you know, you can make a decision for yourself once you read my book, whether this is something that's, you know, you're interested in or not. If you're not, that's fine. Just please, if you bought a hard copy of the book, just pass it on to somebody else without prejudgment. Because you can never judge, accurately judge the inner reality of another person. And this book may be the biggest gift that you give them because what it does is it's going to lead them to a process of their spiritual awakening if they're ready for it and if they want it. And I can tell you that the more of us this, do this, you know, we will, we will eventually bring this world into a state of inner peace and love and joy and, um, and it will happen. So I want to give you the assurance it's going to happen. What's unfolding now in the world needs to unfold in order for people to wake up to what they're doing to themselves. So I don't worry about it. You know, this body's ephemeral. And when I die, it goes back to dust, but my soul moves on just as yours does, just as everybody's does. Well, you know, I, of course, uh, my, my whole purpose of doing this show has been to bring some positivity into this world. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm not always the positive person, <laughs> which is one reason why I don't drive anymore. <laughs> but, but seriously, um, it's difficult to stay positive, even when you know you have to be, or, or you should be, let me put it that way. So I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I, I guess you'd say a guidebook to, to get me to that next level. Cause I've, I've heard people talk about getting on a higher frequency and, you know, getting, a a, a, a uh, 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 well, I can't, the words escaped me now, but, uh, to get that knowledge, that divine knowledge to, uh, to help others. And, and I, I feel like that's what I'm here for. I just haven't got there myself yet. So it's kind of like the blind leading the blind at the moment. <laughs> but I, this is why I bring people like you on. I want to hear a different perspective. I want to know that there's possibly an answer for me out there. And I, I don't know if that's what it is. I'll have to read the book and, and go through the process. But um, tell me a little bit about your meditation because I've had meditation explained to me by other people because I was one of those folks that thought that you could just close off your mind and be silent. And that as a human being, your mind is never silent. There's always something going through. It, it always has to be. So what do you do to meditate? Okay. So, um, so I picked up meditation in the nineties and gave it a go and I never really understood the purpose of meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you know, you, what I heard was, you know, it's, it's to lower your blood pressure and help you feel less stressed and, you know, all that kind of good, and all that good stuff. Those are all good benefits. But the real purpose of meditation is to enable you to go into the silence and the stillness to be able to reconnect with the divine. So universal consciousness is in silence and stillness. And it is these, um, our creator, if you will. It is these opposing impulses that are locked in an embrace. And at the time of the Big Bang, they were divided, uh, explosively divided to uh, work in the divine to enable this process for souls to learn the lessons, to experience what they experience. So I can tell you this meditative practice is to actually learn, and you will learn, how to actually make your mind go entirely silent. And when you get to this point of entering into this silence and this stillness, that is the process that will help you as you cleanse your consciousness and you reach out to the divine. That's the process that will help you raise your vibrational frequency to enable you to connect back with the divine. It does not happen overnight. You need to be consistent with your practice. So every I meditate every morning for between between 90 minutes and two hours you can start with 10 minutes whatever works for you but the purpose is to enter into this silence and stillness to be able to you for you to connect back with the divine 
And when you start to raise your, so this little tingling, what you're doing is you're building new brain cells at the top of your head and you're be impressing them with new knowledge that you're gaining as you go through this process. Mm -hmm. And what this does is this raises your human consciousness uh, vibrational frequency to be able to get to a point where it can connect back with the divine and the divine can enter into you and make itself known to you. And when, and I can tell you that it takes practice to do this, but you know, I talk about it in my book and I, and I share with people what I did to get there and, um, and you can do it. I, I, if I can do it, anybody can do it, but it does take some dedication. It does take practice and you gotta, and you have to do it on a daily basis. You really do. And I would just, I, and I can I would tell just you have to try. Do, <laughs> yeah. And, and I can tell you that when you do it, um, you know, you will eventually come to this place where, where your meditation is your most precious and, and uh, peaceful and calming and loving time uh, of your entire life. It is, it's truly amazing. I, I guess what's the, um, I, I hate to put it this way, but the aggravating thing for me is, everybody that I talk to has a different idea about meditation and I can see how someone can be kind of discouraged because, you know, I'm, my brain doesn't shut down. That's just the way I'm built. It does not shut down, which is one reason why I have, I have insomnia. Um, you know, my, as much as I try to convince myself to, to, quiet down and, and everything it just doesn't work so all i could say is i could try you know i'm always willing to try something but it's like okay well i haven't even finished doing what this other person told me to do now i'm supposed to switch you know do you understand what uh, i'm trying to say yeah yeah no i do understand what you're saying um so I would say, um, you know, if you read this and you go through the seven steps and you understand, you make this choice in your, for yourself. But I'll tell you some of the things I did was, um, is I learned, I had to learn how to do this because, um, uh, so I, I developed this eye issue, this dry eye issue, which prevented me from staring at a computer screen and, and, uh, watching TV and all those kinds of things. So and, you know, a Muslim friend of mine said to me a, a year or two ago, actually, they said, well, you know, you actually needed this because you needed to get to this place where you have this, um, you know, where you're taking this inner journey. And I believe that this was part of this manifestation for this um, eye issue that came to me. It's, it's going to be healed. You know, it is healed in the divine. And uh, I'm just, um, you know, I still need, I'm still doing some stuff to just make it uh, go away altogether here in this materialized form. But I can tell you it has been, you know, kind of the best friend to me because it's it's made me go inside and I'm a very visual learner. So, um, you know, I used to learn by watching and doing and, you know, I love watching TV and stuff like that. So a few things. One is I had to learn um, how to concentrate by listening to audio books. And so to do that, you really need to put on headphones and uh, sit back in a comfortable chair and and pretend like you're going to read a book but instead close your eyes and listen to the spoken word and when you do that you start to train your mind to concentrate on things and that will help you with this process of learning how to be how to quiet your mind down the other thing is you know you think that what you eat is, you know from a nutritional perspective is important for your body and it is but what you feed your mind is more important than what you eat. That's very and true. so it, and so if you are constantly, you know, reading the, you know, all the negative stuff in the news and you're watching violent films and you're watching degradating films or, or films that, you know, kind of, we're all, we all, I used to be, but I'm no longer attracted to, um, to kind of give me stimulation those are the things that I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about worrying about, you know, read a murder mystery that was, you know, pretty involved. And, you know, I'd be thinking about that, or I watched this show on TV and, you know, that's what would invade me in the middle of the night that I'd be waking up and thinking about, I know long I've, I've shut myself off from all that stuff. I don't hardly pay attention to the news. And um, the reason is because what you 
feed your mind, you're reinforcing all of the thoughts and your thinking patterns. And in order to change your thinking patterns, you need to start changing what you feed your mind. And I talk about this in the science chapter. And, you know, what we think about individually, if it is uh, negative, selfish, egotistical, denigrating, slanderous, you know, lying, cheating, if those are the kinds of things we think about, we draw these like experiences into our, into our, um, into our own lives. And you will never be able to re really connect about what was I thinking about that has drawn this into my life. You won't see this connection. But when you understand the mechanics in the universe and how we create these um, life forms that, that are in our consciousness that's around us that we magnetize to eventually bring this experience into our life, when you understand these mechanisms and how it actually works, you can make a conscious choice to change that. And when you understand what you need to cleanse your consciousness of, and you start going through that process to do that, you will start to clean yourself of all of the thinking and the patterns of behavior and breaking up and dissolving these things in the subconscious that enabled you to shift your view of the world and what you think about. I like none of the stuff that's going on in the world right now bothers me at all. Like I, I am not bothered by any of it. I'm sad for... <laughs> I'm I'm sad for the Ukrainians that are you know yeah. uh, in this situation. I, I'm I'm I feel sorry for you know the the Russians that um, you know kind of are doing this. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the the misery that they are causing themselves individually. So we bring this stuff to us. Our individual thinking brings these events and experiences into our light, into our lives. Our collective thinking when it is fed by the same stuff and we have this collective thinking we draw these things into our human experience into our societies into our communities into our countries and around the world and in order for us to change these experiences that come to us these wars and these hates and these all these violent things that come to us we have to individually change our consciousness it will happen but there might be some, and what is already put in motion, it's a law of cause and effect. What's put in motion must come into materialized form. So stuff that, you know, we've collectively been thinking about for the past 20 years and, and engaging in must still come into materialized form. It is a law of cause and effect. You can't avoid it. And so it, for us to change things in the future, we need to start shifting to change our thought patterns. Now, all that stuff will still come in the material form. There's still probably a lot of neg things that we consider negative coming to us around the world. But if we want our futures to be different for our kids and our grandkids and our grandkids, grandkids, <laughs> we need to start individually changing. And when we do that eventually, and it may take a thousand years, eventually we will bring ourselves into this new era of love and peace. Yeah. Unfortunately, we live in this age where most people are selfish um, we've got that uh, instant gratification because, I mean, you know how it is. You get on your cell phone, order something. It's either at your home in the next 20 minutes or tomorrow. And we don't, we don't seem to care what other people think. It's all about, oh, it's, this is my feelings. Well, we're never going to change the world if we keep thinking this way. I mean, it's funny because a lot of the folks that say they want the world to be better aren't making any effort to make it better. So, you know, we, we need to try something different because what we're doing yeah. now is not working. Yeah. Well, and, um, you know, and, and there will be a lot more things that are created that are going to come into manifested form collectively, but it's, it's the stuff that's going to have it. Everything's unfolding for a reason. There's this new dispensation of energy around the around the world. There's going to be a shift in consciousness. The division in the future will not be between the wealthy and the poor. The division in the future will be in consciousness. There will be those that understand that, you know, we are not here to please God. We are here to express God. And God is unconditional love. We are here to express unconditional love to everyone and everything in our environment be it a plant or a rock. <laughs> and, um, and when you actually understand, I believe when people understand this process, they have the opportunity, if 
their soul is ready and if they are willing to actually go through this process. And um, I don't know where anybody's soul is at. Uh, I can't judge on that. I can't even say how long the process will take for them. It may be less time than it took me. It may be more time. I don't know. But, you know, my wife said when I was in my, you know, 33, and I'm looking at taking a, a mid-career uh, master's of business administration, you know, I, I said, well, you know, it's a two-year. I said, look, there's a lot of work, you know, like I'm going to work all day long and then I got to go to school at night. And, you know, it's, and she goes, well, how long is it going to take? And I said, two years. And I said, and she said, well, that time is going to pass anyway. So two years from now, you can look back and say, I did it or I didn't. Which do you want it to be? So what I say to everybody is, look, you know, the time is going to pass anyway. So whether it takes you a year or two years to get where, say, I am today, and I can tell you, your life will be so beautiful and changed if you go on this path to join me on this path and this journey. Um, you cannot even imagine how your life is going to change. It is going to be so wonderful for you. Um, you know, if it takes a year or two years, you can look back. That time's going to pass anyway. So a year or two years from now, you can look back and say, I did it or I didn't do it. You know, the choice is up to you. There's no right or wrong. It's only, uh, it's your choice. You're here to make decisions. And, uh, and what I want to offer to people is, you know, the ability, I want to give you the information so you make that informed choice for yourself. So um, how do folks get a hold of your book? Uh, so available anywhere books are sold, um, bookstores or Amazon. Uh, so it's called A Higher Road, Cleanse Your Consciousness to Transcend the Ego and Ascend Spiritually. And it's by D. Neil Elliott. The D is uh, initial for, for my first name, just to differentiate me as an author and on the internet. Um, my website is dneilelliot.com, but a quick way to get there is ahigherroad.com. And, um, and yeah, you can, it's available in uh, hard copy, trade paperback or ebook form, Kindle, Apple, no, you know, Kobo or Nook. Uh, so you can get it anywhere globally. Okay. Now, is there, do you have any social media? Yeah. So on my website are all my social media. I'm, I'm doing more podcasts and social media at the moment, but uh, yeah, I have Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and, uh, Twitter. <laughs> so <laughs> i'm with you i mean if it wasn't for the podcast and trying to get the show out there i, I probably wouldn't have social media it's just yeah. the truth <laughs> yeah well and i yeah and that's kind of where i'm at but i do post some things but i'm uh i'm more consistent with my podcast since october i've done about 45 podcasts and uh, yeah, i've got another 40 scheduled at the moment so well, one good thing I can say about social media is I have connected with people that I haven't seen in a long time, or I meet people like you and, and it's, it's, a, it's a good influence on my life, but at the same time you can get on there and you get some of the most ugliness that you can imagine on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like anything there's good and there's bad on it. So uh, yeah, it's just you know, how just you use it. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's how you use it and, and what you want to believe. It, what you want to feed your mind, what you feed your mind is what you think about. And what you think about is consistent with your patterns of behavior or thinking. And I'll tell you, if they are contrary to your health, you will draw contrary things to your health. Well, just like any tool, you, you got a hammer, you can build a bridge or you can bash somebody's head in with it. So you can do something good or you can do something bad. Yeah, exactly. So it, you know, so that brings up a point around, I'll uh, just make this one is that in my book in 2011, I did something every day for a year that manifested a $60,000 hardtop Lexus convertible into my life. I thought I was just lucky. I didn't know why or how that happened. I thought I was just lucky. Later in my book, I actually describe in real terms with this new knowledge that I gained about the mechanisms of the universe that I use that actually drew this into my life. And, um, and we do this with everything that comes into our life, whether it's something we, we you know, want and enjoy and would like to have, or something that, um, you know, we kind of just in, merely endure or don't like. So everything that comes into your life is through your own thinking and your own feeling. You think with electrical impulses in the brain, you feel with magnetic impulses in the nervous system. 
These electrical impulses in the brain are a consciousness plan that creates a blueprint of your future experience and your feelings, be it a, a joyous, happy feeling or a, a angry, hateful feeling will magnetize this uh, blueprint. And when you magnetize it enough through repeated thinking and feeling, you will draw that experience or event into your life. Nice. This is all explained if, when you go through the seven steps. I, I want to kiss pinball machine. <laughs> <laughs> well there you go <laughs> you can have alexis i want the kiss pinball machine <laughs> well, but seriously uh, thank you for your time man i really appreciate it and and i like i've said before in the past the show is about bringing alternate ways of thinking something new it, you know things you've been trying has not been working you've got folks out here that are trying to to point you in a different direction and at least try you know What's it going to hurt to at least try? But anyway, um, I, I once again, thank you. And I want to thank everyone that has stopped by this channel. If you're new, um, please subscribe and come back. And if you're a regular, thank you for your support. It's because of you. We do what we do. And so until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.